And Congressman Rokita, if I might, I don't want to mislead. Uh, Lieutenant Governor from Alaska was asking that question. That was one issue. Uh, a, to be a little more specific with you, we were concerned as, or I felt that a majority of the group made some comments about uh, some recommendations that have come out of DOJ um, stating basically that if absentee election ballots were late, then the Secretary of State would be fine. And of course, we understand nobody has worked harder, as you know, and nobody will work harder than Secretaries of State from around this country to ensure that our military are allowed to vote. And I think that's something that we all agree on. It's a common bond that holds us together as, as a nation, but certainly as an organization. It's the one thing that we certainly agree on. But, you know, the concern was that uh, we would be sued, though election absentee ballots are not handled by secretaries of state at all. And in many cases are a different entity of government that has no accountability to us. Mm -hmm then we're held responsible. To answer your question uh, about what the, one of the solutions might be, it was recommended this morning, and I'll have to tell you not by me because my governor's birthday is February the 3rd, and I don't want to share this with him, but someone said if they're suing the state, why not the governor? Why are they suing the secretaries of state? So that, you know, that is an interesting concept because the governor, uh, based on a recent Supreme Court decision in my state, is the absolute authority on all of government within our state. So it's a good question, I think. I think it's a good question. I think it's um, a, a good issue for this group to be working on. Uh, what, what I'm seeing in Washington already, it's, it's really easy. Um, first of all, things happen so quickly, needlessly happen so quickly. For example, you look at our budgeting. Now, in the state of Indiana, we budget every two years. So I had to turn my Secretary of State budget in, and then I lived under that budget. I probably have the same process for two years. Uh, here, we're spending money as we're planning how to spend next year's money, as we're spending the year's money after that, then we're printing money and having our kids pay for it. It just keeps going around and around this hamster wheel for no good reason, in my opinion. We authorize, we appropriate, we obligate, and it starts all over again in a budget if we decide to pass a budget. Um, so in all that, when, when, when we have bills on other issues, it's easy just to say, oh, Chief Election Officer, Secretary of State, make them, make them liable, make them accountable, without, in my opinion, not, so much, not any more thought than that. And so I think it would be great for a group like this to help uh, put forward an alternative solution because we have thought through it, working with a group of Congress people uh, to get that thought into law. And we can actually add some value to this process. Um, first and foremost, I, you know, I, I think elections are states are, should be state-driven to the extent uh, there are fines involved and, and, and accountability measures employed. Uh, that should come at from the state level, not necessarily uh, from the federal government down. Um, but using that as a platform, maybe an approach to solve this problem, who should be accountable, realizing that we're all humans to begin with. Right. Well, there, is there, has there ever been a, a perfect election, John, in the history of the world? No. Will, will there be a perfect election? No. There will be mistakes. But the difference is, do, are those mistakes happening to just African Americans? Are they just being done upon women? Are they being, yeah, you know, that's the difference. Um, will people, uh, you know, Indiana had 55 um, uh, 5,500 poll workers, average age 72. Uh, sure, there'll be mistakes, not because they were 72. The 22-year-olds also make those mistakes. Um, but that's, you know, that's the difference. Are they unintentional, are they ad hoc, or is there a systemic pattern? And I think we've done a very good job before 2000 and after 2000 of making sure that when mistakes happen, they're honest ones. Um, th thank you. Uh, Scott Gessler from the State of Colorado. If you could explain to me, uh, just help me out a little bit on the EAC, or, I'm sorry, on your, uh, on your uh, committee's scope of, scope of oversight and duties. I mean, obviously, we've talked about, uh, during the last few days, the EAC. Uh, we've talked about some of these, apparently, Department of Justice proposals creating private rights of action against Secretaries of State and personal liability and fines against the Secretary of State from the Department of Justice. We've also talked about FFAP. Um, and their activities in the election world, which seem to be driving some states' procedures as well. Uh, for your committee, uh, what, 
what all do you oversee and, uh, and then what do you influence, although you may not have formal oversight authority over it? Uh, the part, uh, the um, Committee on Administration basically oversees the EAC uh, and the FEC, and then we uh, certainly have uh, influence over the FBAP process. Uh, so, of course, we also issue uh, the members parking passes and things like that. <laughs> But that wasn't the heart of your question. <laughs> that, that could be a fair amount of leverage. I, I'm just trying to find out who should I talk to you, and I guess maybe parking pass. Basically, is the way to go. Know, what, we, what we're dealing with is FEC. We've had a, a hearing with them. Uh, EAC. We've had a couple hearings with them, and then uh, the, the military voting process as well. And then, and then the Department of Justice, the, at least discussions or proposals with respect to. Uh, Personal liability of Secretary of State's private rights. Oh, and we certainly would have. Uh, I would hope we have influence over that uh, process as well. How much they is an open question. Guys from Rokita, uh, Ross Miller from Nevada. Uh, some of the discussions uh, this weekend at our conference have centered around the EAC. Uh, obviously, this organization, as you're aware, has twice taken the position that uh, we believe that the EAC should be sunsetted. Uh, there's now some discussion as to what to do in the interim. Uh, and I was wondering if you could just offer a little bit of background as to what's happening in Congress with the AC and offer any potential uh, predictions as to, as to what may eventually result. Uh, thank you, Ross. Um, well, as you all, I'm sure, know, uh, a bill was heard in, in House administration uh, to uh, defund and otherwise sunset, uh, repeal the enabling language uh, that instituted the Election Assistance Commission. I was a <clears throat> and am a, an original co-sponsor of that bill and that uh, my involvement in that bill comes directly out of the two uh, resolutions that came out of this organization uh, that I was uh, involved with helping to author and get passed. Uh, so uh, that bill passed committee. Uh, it went to the House floor uh, for a um, uh, for, a two for a vote that we needed 290 votes for, we did not get that. So we sus it was a suspension vote. We suspended regular order. Uh, I think leadership thought we had the votes. Uh, it did not pass. I am working to see that the EAC uh, repeal bill gets heard in regular order. So there'll be a floor uh, floor um, floor time for it, and then it would need uh, 218 votes to pass the House and go on to the Senate, where I imagine it won't get heard. Uh, but I certainly don't speak for the Senate or what the Senate makeup will be after November. Uh, so that's where that is. So what to do in the meantime? Uh, we have no uh, commissioners, is my understanding. Uh, we have, uh, I think, the attorney acting as the executive director right now, mm -hmm. uh, who I, th I think is public knowledge. If not, I guess we're going to share some news. I, I, that person is being nominated for another agency position. Um, it's, so the question on the table is, especially with regard to this presidential election coming up, what does the EAC do or should it be doing under its charge that would help us, quote unquote, as secretaries of state, as chief elections officers, um, have, a, have a fair and accurate election this fall? And I will be the first to admit I am rusty on duties right now uh, of the EAC, aside from the, from the legislation I've worked on, but, you know, with the other issues that we deal with in Congress, it's, uh, I rely on my memory as, as being a former Secretary of State. But I can't think of what is absolutely necessary that the EAC do in order for this country and these states to have successful, fair, and accurate elections this fall. And so I ask each, each one of you, 